I watched the Apple Keynote, and I have to say I was very impressed by their developments in AI. They have many good things going on with rewrite in particular, and what it's going to deliver in terms of the ability to change documents that you write so that you're no longer concerned about grammar and punctuation and such matters, but it's going to be about the style of your composition because now you can choose your style. So the focus is going to move away from the technical details of your writing and more of what choices you made in terms of how your writing is presented to others. And so we have a really great opportunity here <clears throat> with what Apple has produced. Their AI or Apple intelligence is very fascinating and very profound in what it's going to deliver. And the integration of AI into the operating system to the level that Apple presented offers a very compelling opportunity for productivity and to streamline the way that we work. And I particularly appreciate it given my recent criticisms of generative AI and the user interface, the user experience, the UI UX that we see with tools like ChatGPT, for example, it's a great tool and I use it and I think it's amazing in what it does, but the user interface is limited because it's a web-based interface. And as much as web technology and web development, being someone who has done web development for decades, from the 90s to the late 2010s, I can say that web development offers a tremendous amount of possibility, but it has limitations. And as someone who's also been a desktop and app developer for a few decades, I can say that when you compare web versus on device, on device wins every time when we talk about the depth of integration, the depth of how you can express functionality and process data. So the pendulum swings throughout the years. We go for web or what was called in the very old days, client server. We, we swing from web client server to desktop on-premise and we go back and forth, back and forth. And over time, the most superior experience is going to be the one that's on the device, which is why I make substantial investments in my own case into desktop development. I know the job market for software developers emphasizes web development and web UI. But if you look at the major tech companies, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Apple, those companies, those three in particular, their major products, and let's go ahead and add in Adobe, their major products are desktop. I know Microsoft's trying to make the emphasis on 365, but that hasn't stopped, you know, hundreds of millions of, of people and companies, well, employees at those companies, <clears throat> from using desktop versions of Microsoft Excel, desktop versions of Microsoft Word and PowerPoint, and desktop versions of Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, desktop versions of AutoCAD, and you can go on and on and on. And so it makes sense that what Apple presented in terms of 
their vision for artificial intelligence or Apple intelligence, very clever, AI, Apple intelligence, it makes sense that their particular vision is very compelling. And so what we see is that when you can take that on-premise experience and transform it, that all this question about the cloud starts to somehow dissipate. And I couldn't be more pleased because I like high quality experience in the digital domain, which is why, again, I personally focus on desktop and desktop code and desktop apps and on device apps and those type of experiences, even though I have skills in web development. So I think um, what Apple showed with rewrite is very compelling. I love that particular feature. They have the image playground, which I think is very nice in terms of what we can do with curves and what we can do with organic image generation. I would like to see them push the envelope somehow in photorealistic 4K, 8K, ray traced, HDR, high HDR images because I can do that with ChatGPT currently and I didn't see any emphasis on that. And there may be some processing limitations for why that would be. But I would like to see some developments in that in that arena. So I liked I liked that and where that was going. I literally like, I really like what they did with Siri. Because what they showed with Siri is what we always thought Siri would be the first time we ever hear about something like Siri right and they finally got it there at least that's what the demo shows now when we get these in our hands and we try them out in the real world that's a totally different matter and that vision that Apple showed is what I see eventually happening with some parts in the open source ecosystem in terms of integrating large language models and I wouldn't really call them large language models at this point. I would call them micro language models because you're not really running a large language model on the device, right? Large language models are for the cloud. That's for a data center. That's for these masses of computers, which I'm going to talk about here in just a moment. But um, I think Apple has won the artificial intelligence race. I thought it was going to be Google because Google had everything going for them. They have the data centers. They have the cloud expertise. They were the first. They're the ones that came up with this idea of generative AI in the first place. But it just goes to show just because you're first doesn't mean you're going to be the one that remains standing. What it shows is that when you can create a high quality, high, I'm emphasizing high quality, because there are other experiences right now that are very similar to what Apple is representing, but you wouldn't really call them high quality. <clears throat> so that's why I advocate for Apple. If you're not going to do Linux, I would advocate you know, Apple because they have a high quality, coherent end-to-end -end streamline process that works extremely well and is very well refined that that matches my own sensibility with life with what I look for and so that's why I bring up Apple right and so that's what we see is that we have a very intriguing opportunity here with technology and with the tools that exist so I'm going to switch gears here and talk about NVIDIA. NVIDIA, they have the entire hardware stack, the entire hardware stack, servers, switches, and super compute nodes. And the crowd couldn't be more pleased with these developments. They also have robotics. Robotics is coming. 
they have the robotics, or as they used to say, we have the technology. So, robots are coming to every aspect of the reality in what we would call the first world. In the Western world, we have robotics on the way. And I think this is a very good development when I look at the broader presentation from um, the CEO of NVIDIA. He did a very good job explaining this. Now, his talk is about, um, it's an hour and 30 minutes at Computex in Taipei, Taiwan. <clears throat> and he did a fantastic job going through the technology, going through the history, and I'm going to cover some of the major points that resonated with me. The entire presentation was absolutely awesome, but when we look at robotics in particular, we see where all of this that they've been talking about is headed. It's headed in a very amazing direction. And that direction is the ability to transform productivity, transform the way we move product, the way that we build product, and not just that, but the way that we build environments is all going to move up potentially in quality because I do think that human beings at the maximum level does exceed, does do a superior job in anything, the human at the maximum level. However, you got to ask yourself, when have you seen a human at the maximum level in great numbers, right? Every once in a while, you'll see an exceptional human. You would see someone that's able to do the impossible, to go to the maximum level. But how often is that? So when you can take greatness and you can take a great plan, a great design, a great innovation, and you can automate it and streamline it and express it through the machine and digital topology, then what you get is quality expressed in a more consistent and holistic way across the board. And that is the part about robotics that intrigues me and excites me the most. So... I think that Hinsing Wong has done a great job. And let's look into that just a little bit more. But first, let's switch gears and talk about AMD. AMD is an extraordinary company. And Dr. Lisa Su, the head of AMD, has done an amazing job turning this company around. I wrote one of the first blog posts that I know of that foretold the rise of AMD. And I saw the immense possibility in AMD processors in the Ryzen series. And <clears throat> my transition from Intel to AMD was on the basis of the Spectre and Meltdown and Spoiler vulnerabilities. And usually when I see engineering uh, failures of that magnitude that's enough for me to want to switch because I judge technology on the basis of its quality rather than its features and capabilities I'm not a features or capability person I am first and foremost about how rigorous and hot and how high quality the technology is and I apply that to many things in life that's my modus operandi in terms of how I evaluate technology and evaluate things, physical things. So the 
AMD Ryzen um, series that's coming out is great and all, but this third gen AMD Ryzen AI um, architecture is quite intriguing in terms of how it's going to impact laptops and possibly eventually um, desktops. And what surprised me was the performance that you have with this AMD Ryzen AI processor. 50 tops is nothing to um, bat an eye at. Um, and I was thoroughly impressed in what it took to get to 50 tops, right? And at first I was like, okay, 10 tops more than what others are doing on average. Okay, I can get that. But when Dr. Lisa Sue went into the deep details of uh, what is going on with the NPU or the neural processing unit, in this case, AMD's implementation of the MPU, I was thoroughly impressed, right? So her actual presentation on the difference between um, 8-bit floating point and 16-bit floating point and how block floating point 16 actually creates a good solution that um, gives you performance, right, as well as quality accuracy it was right it was like that is amazing so so um i think she she um really shows her engineering background because for those that don't know dr lisa sue was a researcher for many decades and has actual patents from her time working at ibm and she is very well read and studied and the engineering, the actual engineering of things like processors and graphics units. And so it shows when you have an engineer, someone with that background leading a company like AMD and has led it to a very strong leadership position in terms of um, CPUs, GPUs and the like. And her Epic C CPU, um, which is a competitor to Intel Xeon, um, has um, accomplished some amazing things in terms of not only the companies that have adopted it, right, but according to her presentation here, <clears throat> you have about 33% of major data centers adopting this particular um, CPU. And... I've always wanted to have an epic CPU, right? I, one of my goals in life, you know, de you know, depending on how circumstances evolve, is to have a workstation that has a epic uh, CPU, you know. And people ask, "What are you What are you doing with that?" And I'm like, "Don't worry about it. Maybe I want to run some AI stuff, you know, whatever." Um, really, I want to run like you know, a cluster of virtual machines and do some amazing stuff with build systems and all that kind of stuff. But that's besides the point. She has some great technology and has done a great job showing what's possible when you put your mind to turning a company around and turning around technology. As I mentioned earlier, Hensing Wong has done a great job explaining where NVIDIA is in terms of information technology. But I like this part of his presentation where he brings out a GPU. All gamers are familiar with this particular item. This is how a majority of video games get played. But people think that when AI is running, it's running off of that type of GPU and it's not. That large cabinet of technology that you see on the right hand side of the screen that he's pointing at, that entire thing runs in AI, right? That's a small node in a data center. So it's not the GPU that's in your desktop computer that runs AI, 
but really it's a, you might call it a representation of the human body, but in machine form. That right there is a spine. It's a digital, it's an electronic spine. That's actually what he calls it. It's called a spine. And I don't know if he knows this. I don't know if it, people are aware of this. But the thing of it is, is that whether it was done on purpose or not, it represents the biology and structure from nature to move information through through a, a neurological system. They've made a copper-based, um, wire-based equivalent of the human spinal cord. And this is the part that you might call the brain. This whole thing right here is an actual GPU. It's not the same as the GPU board that goes into a desktop computer. This is an entirely different type of GPU. It has the same nature as the, D the GPU that goes in a desktop, but this one is designed primarily for running data more so than graphics, okay? But there is a GPU core on, the, on both sides, the left and the right. And according to um, the CEO here, they are the largest chips that TSMC actually is able to manufacture. And 10 terabytes, I'm not making that up. I'm not even um, saying that the wrong way. He literally says there's 10 terabytes of data that moves between both of those chips per second. And look at that, 20 teraflops, floating point four. Now, what this graph doesn't really emphasize is that in order to get some of this performance gains, they had to drop from floating point 16, floating point eight, floating point four, but that's a small little matter, right? Anyway, 20,000 teraflops. And then this is the switch. Um, I was impressed uh, by this because it's like, they knew they couldn't get the expertise for InfiniBand networking and out there in the labor market. So <clears throat> NVIDIA came up with a switch that could take regular Ethernet and give it many of the qualities and capabilities of InfiniBand, but in a way that's more approachable to network and system admins working these data centers and putting this technology together. And so, um, an amazing um, pivot and response to the entire situation because AI, or what we call, what they're calling AI, which is actually just machine learning, um, is data heavy. It's data heavy, and it's not RAM uh, bound. It's not CPU bound, so per se. Well, it is, but when you can run it on a on a GPU. It's less RAM bound, right? And it's more about the movement of the information across a cluster of GPUs. And that's what um, is accomplished here. And so this is NVIDIA showing how a single node in a data center comes together. And it's an amazing presentation using NVIDIA's own technology to put that um, visualization together for those that are in attendance. Liquid cooled, and um, that's one node. And then you have several of those nodes in a data center. And all of that equipment and hardware may represent about, okay, 32,000 GPUs, approximately um, a few million to a few billion dollars. Of investment um, for those that need to get that level of hardware capability and the audience was really taken away by this presentation and so was I, I was like that is baller that's absolutely a baller way to use visualization and graphics to get the point across on what a modern data center looks like that runs off of GPUs or should we say hyperscale GPUs <clears throat> so warehouses are going to be automated. They already are. 
but they're going to be even more so. And so robots for picking product, robots for, you know, unloading trucks, robots for, you know, stacking um, material into racks, into bin locations. I have a strong history with warehouse and logistics and supply chain. I've automated them. I have worked in them, you know, prior to uh, IT. I was working in a warehouse doing the basic receiving and uh, logistics functions. And so I understand warehouse um, very intuitively. And seeing them actually transform that is amazing. Where you can go from truck to production line and back out to shipping. And there's many possibilities for automation there. And the robots are coming. And um, I never thought I would see it to this level in my lifetime, but it's here. And it's a moment to look at what the opportunities are rather than be fearful or be concerned about what might be lost. But um, NVIDIA has done an amazing job bringing this technology uh, to the public and We'll see what happens from here. In all the time that I have been talking about AI, even those moments when I said I'm not going to talk about AI again, I never chimed in on the conversation. Will AI take jobs? Will AI cause industries to be disrupted? My response to that is, and I'm going to explain why I say this, The answer is no. All this doom and gloom that people are seeing in the media, in marketing, in sales materials from companies selling AI and all of this, you you do know that all of that is um, to bring up stock prices and to um, actually um, convince potential buyers to buy the product, the AI product. There's nothing wrong with that. That is the way um, your business works. That's just the way business works. But you have to be smart enough to look through that, look past that. And you got to be like, okay, yeah. Um, You will see instances where employers will um, try to downsize on the basis of AI. And then it will become obvious that that decision was a mistake because... The thing of it is, is that the essential functions that has to be done is being done from a company ran by a human. Okay, you have a CEO at the top and a board of directors in terms of public companies. They are human beings running a company and their customers, their ultimate customers, are other human beings. It's a human to human transaction. Okay? So that's step one. Step two is the aspect of that transaction has subjective, not objective, not logical. The aspects of that transaction ultimately has subjective and emotional components to it. Another way of saying that is your customer is asking, what's in it for me? How do I benefit? What can I get out of this thing that you're trying to sell me? Right? So because of that subjective aspect, the true expert in subjectivity is another human being. So there are many aspects of an operation, the physical and even digital and administrative steps to do something that you can audit that you can automate. However, comma you got to have human beings in the pipeline from the seller to the buyer. 
So in between that transaction, in between that process of transacting, from the owners of the company to the customers, in between, you have to have individuals, you know, of a variable, um, you know, level of representation in terms of how many you need to ensure that the subjective factors are considered to an extent that will improve the chances that product continues to be purchased. Because it goes like this. Just because you have a product that may be the best in class doesn't mean anybody's going to buy it. It doesn't mean that at all. In fact, sometimes people will buy an alternative product on the basis of price, on the basis of um, utility, how, how much utility they need to get out of it. So, for example, do they need a product that lasts, you know, um, one month or one year or seven years? How much utility they need to get out of it, right? And you may have a product that has seven years of utility, but they don't care. And they may not care because of some other emotional subjective factors that you have to then work with to see if there is some reconciliation that could be addressed to uh, bring about a sale, a transaction. So for that, you got to have all the pieces in place. And I'm not talking about salespeople or marketing people. I'm talking about people that are involved in the operation. So here's an example. You have a company, they produce a product that is, um, let's say it's the high quality type of product. For them to execute that properly, there is a element in the production of that product that you can't just automate because if you do, you take out the built-in quality control, the built-in quality assessment from those that can physically um, participate and assist in the creation of that product. Whether it's packing up boxes, testing items, or you name it. Now, I know that there are naysayers that say, yeah, yada, yada, yada. But trust me, um, if you're a master business person, master salesperson like me, you know that those subjective factors, they rule everything. They are the most dominant aspect. And if you are not able to design those subjective aspects into your actual company's DNA and way of doing business, then you're not going to do as much business as you think because somebody else can come around and take that business away. So a major element of that that's usually not um, appreciated up until now is the involvement of workers because they create a culture, they create an environment, they create a vibe, they create a matrix. They create a matrix environment that influences the final result that is produced in the form of a product or service that resonates or doesn't resonate with a would-be customer. So that's why, fundamentally, the jobs are not actually going away. But that doesn't mean that the jobs won't change, you see. The jobs will change in terms of how they're executed, for good or bad. Because sometimes you can over-automate to the extent that you wash away all the things that give you the competitive advantage that really differentiates you in such a way that makes what you're selling um, all the more attractive, right? So you can over-automate and you can under-automate. You got to find the right balance. And that is the actual true opportunity, the truest opportunity with what we have here from these announcements from Apple, the um, presentation from NVIDIA, and what AMD is showing when we're talking about data center CPUs and desktops and other tools of analysis 
for the inventors, innovators in the individual sense, right? So, so those that know what I'm talking about from a business management standpoint, um, they, they will be able to capitalize on this. But those that don't really know how the technology really applies, they're going to be kind of lost. And you're going to see some tragic instances of downsizing or excessive upsizing or whatever, right? And that's just par for the course, right? But um, I'm excited about this, what so-called AI, you know, it's really machine learning is the proper term for it, but I'm not going to keep correcting uh, people or maybe even myself on that because that term AI has now stuck. But I'm optimistic about AI. I just know that everything for as remarkable as it seems is not the end all be all. And there is still a case and will remain a case for the human touch, the human value. Because at the end of the day, all of this is being made for us as a civilization, right? Otherwise, there's no point. So I hope you liked that discussion. I know I did. And um, continue to stay tapped in. And I will catch you on the next one.